Number 1. Sherry was last seen at approximately 9.30 a.m. on June 6, 1984 in downtown Greenville, Alabama. She and her stepfather were at the First National Bank and he gave her a dollar to buy a soda. Sherry left the bank and was last seen crossing the street towards the Chevron gas station, where there was a soda machine. When her stepfather returned to his pickup truck 15 minutes later, Sherry was nowhere to be found. All of Sherry's relatives, including her biological father, were investigated by police for possible involvement in her case. Both her father and her stepfather have been ruled out as suspects. Investigators got information that Sherry may have been in the St. Stephen, Alabama area, near Beto Road, later that month. There were three reported sightings of Sherry by three different people after her disappearance. Witnesses saw Sherry walking across the parking lot by the General Telephone Building and Jernigan's Furniture Store on her way to the gas station. Fifteen minutes later, Raymond was done at the bank and went out to his truck. He was surprised Sherry was not there waiting for him. When 25 more minutes passed with no sign of Sherry panic said it. Raymond called Betty at the Waffle House to see if Sherry had stopped by there for a visit. Betty said no, she had last seen her daughter that morning fast asleep on the couch. Raymond checked the obvious places for his stepdaughter, like the Chevron, but had no luck. He also asked around at the tractor shop and the feed store. Sherry's nickname was Little Farmer for a reason. She loved everything to do with farming, including hanging out at those stores. But no one had seen Sherry. The young girl was finally reported missing at 11.46 a.m. Before long a massive search effort was underway. Volunteers combed the city and surrounding areas. An aerial search was even conducted by Crenshaw Flying Service. Family, friends, and volunteers printed off countless missing person posters and plastered them across the city and neighboring towns. Despite all of the efforts, Sherry remains missing. Sherry is a Caucasian female with brown hair and brown eyes. When she disappeared in 1984, she was 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighed 100 to 120 pounds. She has two distinguishing marks, a 2-inch scar on her abdomen and a 1-inch scar on her back near her shoulder. Sherry was last seen wearing a long-sleeved red plaid flannel shirt, light jeans, gray runners with Velcro fastenings, and a watch with a black band. Did Sherry run away from home? Sherry's family thinks it is unlikely. As heartbreaking as it is to think about, it is not uncommon for children to run away from home. In fact, in 1984 the Department of Health and Human Services reported to Congress that the number of runaway youth in the United States was more than one million. But was Sherry one of those million runaways? Her mother Betty has always insisted her daughter was a happy and content child with no significant issues. She said Sherry had no reason to leave home. Sherry was excited about the plans she had made for the day she disappeared. She was going to watch her favorite TV show and visit her grandmother. By all accounts Sherry was the type of child who did what she was told. And she did not take any of her belongings with her when she headed into town. Even more, she has never once contacted her family in the decades she has been missing. Stranger abductions are rare, but Sherry could have been kidnapped by someone as she walked across the parking lot to go buy a drink. It does not take long to grab a person and pull them into your vehicle. Sherry also could have been snatched from the Chevron station. Sherry's mom has pointed out that in 1984 vending machines did not give change. Maybe Sherry approached a stranger at the gas station to ask for change and the person took advantage of the opportunity and kidnapped her. Three unconfirmed sightings of Sherry by three different people also support the stranger abduction theory. All of the alleged sightings placed Sherry with a man who looked to be around 50 years old and 5 feet 8 inches tall. He had a husky build and a weathered complexion. One of the witnesses reported they heard the young girl call the man BJ. Disturbingly, all three witnesses told the authorities the person they believed was Sherry appeared to be very upset, disheveled, and dazed. Was Sherry killed by someone she knew? It is a possibility. It is no surprise that Raymond, Sherry's stepdad, was the first person questioned by the police. He was the last person to see her, after all. Raymond cooperated with the authorities and answered all of their questions. But when they asked him to take a polygraph test he refused. 
Regardless, the police have said he was never a suspect in the case. And his wife Betty was positive Raymond did not harm his stepdaughter. She said he never got over the fact that Sherry was with him when she vanished. Just before Raymond died in April 2003, he told his wife from his hospital bed, Betty, I wish I could go get Sherry and bring her home to you, but I can't because I don't know where she is. If Raymond was not involved in Sherry's disappearance, could it be someone else she knew? In 2018, the Berkeley County Sheriff's Office in South Carolina said Sherry had stayed with her stepsister and her stepsister's husband in the St. Stephen area near Betor Road back in the summer of 1983. The authorities had received a tip that Sherry was spotted in the same area after she was reported missing in 1984. Were these family members somehow involved in Sherry's disappearance? If so, did they take her against her will? Or had Sherry actually run away from home and sought shelter in South Carolina for some reason? In 2019, there was a very startling post on the Sherry Lynn Marlar still missing Facebook page. A woman named Ryan Welch Anderson said that her and a group of volunteers had been searching tirelessly for years to find out what had happened to Sherry. They found evidence they refused to keep to themselves any longer. Part of the post reads, Sherry Marler was murdered and dismembered by someone she knew very well, not her stepfather, and thrown into a hog pen in Butler County. We believe the person who murdered her is deceased. We strongly suspect there were one or two other people there at the time of her death and that they are also deceased. We strongly suspect she was pregnant at the time. We believe she was a victim of a multiple family-based incest pedophilia ring that involved people from both Butler and Crenshaw counties. Ryan says they unearthed a pig farm that was functional in 1984, but had since been abandoned and reclaimed by nature. The group says they have video footage of two separate cadaver dog teams confirming hits on human remains in the area. During their excavation, the group discovered clothing that was sent in for DNA testing. The Greenville Police Department said no DNA evidence was found on the material. And to me, the fabric looks more like a burlap sack than the jeans or red flannel shirt Sherry was said to be wearing when she vanished. Ryan also states that a surviving family member of the person she thinks murdered Sherry allowed her to look through a box of old photos. Some of the photos showed the pig farm up and running. And one photo in particular shocked Ryan. It was a photo of a pig standing by what she says is a severed human head that had not yet decomposed. Ryan says she took a picture of the photo with her phone. The original photo was reportedly seized from the family member by law enforcement and turned over to the FBI. However, when nothing happened with the case Ryan called the FBI and says she was told they had never received any such photo. I think it is hard to tell exactly what is in the photo, it may be one of those situations where something takes the shape of something you expect to see. Whether or not Ryan and this group of searchers has found evidence of Sherry remains to be seen, but their dedication to the case and to finding answers for Sherry's loved ones cannot be questioned. What do you think happened to Sherry? Sherry was a fun-loving tomboy who enjoyed farming, being outside, and listening to her Kenny Rogers albums. She had an adventurous spirit and could not wait to trade in her moped for a three-wheeler on her 13th birthday. Sherry's loved ones have had to live decades without answers. Every day, her mom Betty has had to face the horrible truth that her daughter is still missing. And her stepdad Raymond died without ever finding out what happened to Sherry. Somehow, though, Betty still manages to find some solace. She said, Sherry was always a happy little girl, and that's what I remember the most, even in my dreams. Betty has fought hard to keep the memory of her daughter alive. She opened Enterprise Restaurant on June 6, 2010, the 26th anniversary of Sherry's disappearance. The sign on the street said the restaurant was opened in honor and memory of Sherry Lynn Marler. Betty explained, we want to honor her memory. But we want also to heighten people's awareness of the reality of children missing every day in this country. To that end, Betty joined Team Hope, Help Offering Parents Empowerment, a program created by the National Center for Missing and exploited children to train the family members of missing or sexually exploited children so they can help others in their situation. Betty said, at Team Hope, we are members of a club that no one wants to belong to. I volunteer in the hope 
that no one else will ever have to go through what our family has been through. If you have any information about Sherry's disappearance please contact the Greenville Police Department at 334-382-7461 or the Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-THE-LOST, 1-800-843-5678. Number 2. On March 12, 1978, 16-year-old Pauline Robin Burgett was at home alone in her family's duplex apartment located near 26th Street and McDowell Road in Phoenix, Arizona. Robin's mother and brother Chad had been away all weekend on a trip. Around 5 p.m., 11-year-old Chad returned home and walked into his sister Robin's bedroom and encountered a gruesome scene. Robin had been murdered. An autopsy later determined she had been sexually assaulted and stabbed repeatedly. The authorities discovered very few clues of the scene, and despite a lengthy and thorough investigation, Robin's murder case remains unsolved. Was Robin killed by a stranger during a burglary? This theory is unlikely. There was neither any reported signs of forced entry, nor any items known to be missing from Robin's home. It looks as though Robin may have known her killer and let him in. Could Robin have been murdered by a random maniac who just happened to stumble upon her at home alone? Maybe, but it is doubtful. Phoenix Police Cold Case Detective Clark Schwartzkopf told the media Robin's murder was notably brutal. Debt. Schwartzkopf stressed, whoever committed the crime, this was a crime of anger and rage, and Robin knew her perpetrator. Taking into consideration there was no sign of forced entry, as well as the personal and brutal nature of the crime, it is a safe bet Robin was raped and stabbed to death by someone she knew. Was Robin murdered by her boyfriend? Of course, as we all know too well, in murder cases a woman's partner is usually the prime suspect, and sadly often rightly so. The police determined Robin left her friend's house the night before she was killed at approximately 8 p.m. She told her friend she was headed to meet her then-boyfriend, who thus far has remained unnamed by police. Some reports indicate Robin was hoping to have her boyfriend over for dinner after she arrived home, but the police have never made clear if this get-together occurred. Could Robin's boyfriend have murdered her in a fit of rage? This is a highly probable theory, I believe, until we learn about the DNA evidence. Was Robin killed by an ex-boyfriend, friend, or acquaintance? I think this is possible. In fact, debt. Schwarzkopf has informed the media Robin was a high school dropout with plenty of free time to date. He said, being out of school, she had a lot of boyfriends, a lot of ex-boyfriends, what we're hoping is that somewhere along the line, someone said something to someone and admitted to something. Putting aside the judgy undercurrents in this statement, it does significantly whiten the suspect pool. Did a jealous ex-boyfriend confront Robin and murder her? Quite possibly, yes. Robin had also recently been babysitting at a housing complex for an extended period of time leading up to her death. Debt. Schwarzkopf said she had been brought back home early. And we know there were problems at the other complex with a gentleman making advances on her while she was babysitting there for the three weeks before her murder. Overall, I think this lead is promising. No doubt the police questioned the person of interest, but I would like to know more about what transpired between Robin and the threatening man who cut her babysitting job short. The best lead in Robin's case is the DNA profiles the police have generated from evidence at the murder scene. We need to applaud the authorities for their careful collection of evidence long before DNA was considered a factor. After examining the DNA evidence, investigators were able to determine at least two people were present when Robin was murdered. Debt. Schwarzkopf explained although it is good to have DNA evidence, it is not much use unless they can match it to a suspect's. Given the recent advances in DNA technology and the use of familial DNA to finally nab serial killers like the Golden State Killer and the Grim Sleeper, hopefully Robin's killers will be identified one day soon. Keep in mind, the police definitely would have checked the DNA profiles against Robin's then-boyfriend, her known ex-boyfriends, and the creepy guy who harassed Robin while she was babysitting. So if Robin was indeed murdered by someone known to her, the odds are high that person was more of an acquaintance and has yet to be on the police's radar. Who do you think killed Robin? Chad, Robin's brother, fondly recalls how his outgoing sister loved life and loved being outdoors. She hated wearing shoes and loved the hot summers. 
she was a great sister, and she was my friend. Although it is impossible for the Burgett family to ever really have closure after the tragic loss of Robin Chad, feels the person who did it has been free long enough. If you know anything about what happened to Robin, please call the Phoenix Police Department at 602-262-6011 or silent witness at either 480 witness 948-6377 or 1-800-343-TIPS-8477. There is a $1,000 reward in this case. Number 3. On the night of June 9, 1995, six-year-old Morgan Nick went to a Little League baseball game in Alma, Arkansas with her mother, Colleen. During it, two children asked her to come to a field to catch fireflies. At 10.30 p.m., Colleen allowed her to go with them. However, when the game ended at 10.45 p.m., the girls returned from the field without her and said that she was by Colleen's car getting sand out of her shoes. However, when Colleen went over to it, she wasn't there, and as the people left, panic and fear overwhelmed her. Colleen had one of the coaches talk to the two children and they remembered seeing a man they described as creepy in a red pickup truck talking to Morgan. It left around the same time she was last seen. Another coach called 911 to report her missing. Within minutes, a massive search was started by law enforcement, but she could not be found. For years, Colleen has searched for her. She has now become a leading activist for missing children across the country. She was able to turn her disappearance into a nationwide news story. One year after Morgan was abducted, Colleen started the Morgan Nick Foundation, a non-profit organization that helps assist families with missing children and has helped bring several homes safely. In 2001, Colleen was asked to help with the case of missing five-month-old Jacqueline Castaneda. The foundation made posters and flyers for her and sent emails about her disappearance. She has never been found. The police are looking for a white male described by Morgan's friends as creepy. In 1995, he was described as being between the ages of 23 and 38, six foot tall and 180 pounds. He has never been identified. He was driving a dull red older Ford pickup with a white camper shell. It is suspected that Morgan's disappearance may have been related to two attempted abductions that happened around the time that she was abducted. On the morning of June 9, a four-year-old was pulled into a truck outside a laundromat in Alma. Fortunately, her mother was able to retrieve her. On June 10, a nine-year-old was forced into the men's restroom at a convenience store in Fort Smith, 10 miles away. She was able to escape as well. In both cases, the abductor and his vehicle was similar in description to Morgan's. Unsolved. If Morgan is still alive, she would be now 33 years old. In August 2012, Tanya Smith and James Monhart, two previously convicted felons, were arrested for computer fraud after attempting to assume her identity. However, it is not believed that they are connected to her disappearance. In December 2017, a property was searched in connection to it. However, nothing was found. The property belonged to a man who had been a person of interest in this case since the beginning. He is currently in prison on unrelated charges, but refuses to discuss it. In April 2021, the documentary Still Missing aired in Arkansas about Morgan. As a result of the documentary, over 300 leads came in, some of which were very credible and had never been reported before. Colleen said that she felt encouraged by the documentary and the leads and maintains hope that Morgan will return to her. During the airing of Still Missing and subsequent interviews with Colleen about the documentary, a picture of a red truck was repeatedly released that was taken at the baseball field the day of the abduction and was believed to have been the one used to abduct Morgan. The picture of the truck had never been released to the public before and is believed to have been a Chevrolet truck possibly a Silverado or an S10. There are also potential plans to air still missing on a national streaming platform to provide further exposure to this case. In November 2021, possibly due to leads that had come in due to the release of still missing, it was announced that convicted felon and Arkansas native Billy Jack Lynx was named a person of interest in this case. Several months after Morgan was abducted, he had attempted to abduct another child at a Sonic restaurant in Van Buren, approximately eight miles from where Morgan was last seen. 
He allegedly drove a red Chevy truck that was described as similar to the red truck that was seen at the baseball field where Morgan was last seen. Although Lynx died in prison in 2000, law enforcement is seeking to interview people who knew Lynx to determine if he is connected to this case. Number 4. Mary, a barmaid by trade, was the second wife of Dominic Bataraco. By all accounts, it was a tumultuous marriage rife with infidelity and acts of domestic violence. Being married to Dominic wasn't easy for Mary. She often tried to shield her two daughters, Sherry and Beth, from the trauma by sending the two girls to a friend's house when they were young. This was a relationship doomed to fail. Initially, Dominic had no intention of reporting his wife's disappearance and seemed unconcerned as to her whereabouts. Dominic even discouraged Mary's daughters, Sherry and Beth, who were now grown women, to report their mother missing despite their obvious worry. Sherry and Beth knew something was wrong and ignored Dominic's wishes by contacting the police. When police questioned Dominic he stated that he and Mary had come to an agreement that it was time for them to go their separate ways and were planning on divorcing. Dominic continued by saying that Mary agreed to take $100,000 in cash in exchange for leaving the house and not making any claims to the home. Dominic went on to say that as far as he knew that Mary had left the home, and he had no reason to be concerned. At the time police believed Dominic's story, but it wouldn't stay that way for long. In 1985 the case of what happened to Mary Bataraco took a turn. An informant in federal witness protection came forward with a tip. The informant claimed that Mary Bataraco had been murdered. The informant told police that the murder was a contract hit that was taken out on Mary's life at the behest of no other but her husband, Dominic Bataraco. It was believed that Dominic used his son, Joe, a known Hell's Angel, to put out the contract on Mary's life after she threatened to tell police about Dominic's illegal activities and business dealings. Joe had connections through the Hell's Angels organization and was known to take care of the more unsavory tasks when Dominic didn't want to get his hands dirty. Six years after Mary Bataraco's disappearance her case was finally classified as a homicide. While it appears family, friends, and police had been suspicious for some time, the time had finally come for a full investigation into Mary and her whereabouts. However, it would still take another full year, in 1991, before Mary would be declared legally dead. 1990 was also an eventful year for Joe, Dominic's son. Joe, a known hell's angel, went to jail on an arson charge. However, despite Joe's known criminal activity and his suspected role in Mary Bataraco's now murder it has yet to be said whether or not Joe is considered a suspect in Mary's death. Ernest Dachenhausen, age 64, had been employed by Dominic Bataraco and was a known associate of his. Police got wind of the relationship between the two men and suspected that Ernest may have played a role in Mary's disappearance or knew something about what happened to Mary Bataraco. In September 2007 police started to excavate the yard of Dachenhausen's former home located in Newton, Connecticut. According to Lt. J. Paul Vance, the only thing found in the yard was a few buried cars. Lt. Vance declined to say what exactly police were looking for on Ernest Atchenhausen's former property, but referenced the sealed court documents of Mary Bataraco's cold case. In April 2008 Ernest Atchenhausen was arrested on misdemeanor charges due to attempting to interfere with the police department's investigation. Dachenhausen was found not guilty on those charges in 2009. With the number one lead pointing to Dominic Bataraco, he is definitely the prime suspect in Mary's murder. Police have been taking a closer look at Dominic, his relationship with Mary, and his behavior. It was found that police were called multiple times to the Bataraco home due to domestic violence incidents in which Mary was beaten by Dominic. It was also discovered that Dominic already had another girlfriend before Mary went missing. Dominic's girlfriend, Joan, moved into the Bataraco home only a few weeks after Mary went missing. Joan went on to become Dominic's third wife. Furthermore, no sign of the $100,000 that Dominic had claimed to Haven given Mary before her disappearance had ever been found. Dominic Bataraco's home, the outbuildings on his property, and the woods surrounding his house were searched for any sign or evidence of Mary Bataraco. 
nothing was found. Dominic Bataraco just couldn't leave well enough alone. In 2013, despite there being no solid evidence that Dominic was involved in his wife Mary's murder, he attempted to bribe a state superior judge with the help of his lifelong friend, Ronald Richter. Dominic was hoping that $100,000 would sway the judge enough into influencing the grand jury investigating Mary Bataraco's murder. While Dominic was trying to keep himself out of trouble he ended up causing himself even more strife. Dominic Bataraco was charged with bribery for attempting to bribe a judge. He received a seven-year prison sentence and three years of special parole. Dominic's friend, Ronald Richter, was given immunity in exchange for his testimony for the role that he played in bribing the judge. Dominic Bataraco was granted early release in October of 2016. Thus far, Mary Bataraco's remains have not been found. While there is not yet enough evidence to charge anyone Dominic Bataraco still remains the prime suspect. While it appears Dominic may have escaped charges in the court of law it is doubtful he will ever escape the court of public opinion and the air of suspicion that hovers over him. Number 5. 28-year-old biology graduate student, Jane Marie Pritchard was found on September 20, 1986 by campers with a gunshot to her back. She had spent the day working at the Blackbird Forest State Park in Delaware. She was studying the wild hog peanut for her master's degree. She had driven 115 miles in her 1980 Chevy Blazer. Inside her, her vehicle was her research equipment. She had arrived at 7.30 a.m., but at 5.30 that day, her partially disrobed body was found. A squirrel hunter came forward and said that he saw Jane talking to another hunter around 10 a.m. A sketch was done of the hunter, but the police had more interest in the squirrel hunter that had come forward. He was arrested and charged with the murder, but in August of 1987, the case fell apart and the charges were withdrawn. DNA was taken from a hair sample, and it proved that the squirrel hunter wasn't the killer. The main theory in Jane's murder was that it was a crime of opportunity. It was the beginning of hunting season, and there were at least 25-50 hunters in the park that day. It was more than likely that Jane was sexually assaulted or was in the process of being sexually assaulted. She could have resisted, and she was killed in retaliation. Jane's death wasn't ruled as an accidental shooting due to the detail of her body being disrobed. The unknown hunter that she was seen talking to on the morning of her death was described as a white male, around 5'9 with a medium build wearing a brown jacket and blue jeans. Jane grew up in Maryland on a 38-acre farm. She was close to her brother, Keith as well as her older brother, Greg and sister, Beth. She was described as being independent and adventurous. She had taken a cross-country trip in her 1966 Datsun 2000 by herself after college. The car is still kept by the family. She was working at a prominent botanical garden caked Brookside Gardens in Montgomery County, Maryland. She was working on her master degree botany at the University of Maryland's College Park campus. She was living just outside of Washington, D.C. in Clarksburg, Maryland. On the day she died, she had a minute-by-minute recording of data that had ended abruptly before 10 a.m. The Monday after Jane's body was a found, a man called the police and said he had seen her when he was hunting squirrels in the morning on the day Jane was found. Police had interviewed nearly 300 people. Technicians from DuPont County conducted a detailed analysis of the shotgun pellets that had hit the woman, but they came up empty. Over the months that followed, all the leads were dried up or were dead-ended. Jane Marie Pritchard became a cold case. In 2015, a new cold case unit tackled the case. Jane's family was a delighted to hear that her case was being investigated. It had given them hope. The cold case unit was unable to come up with any new evidence or follow any leads.